All right, welcome everybody to the other side of the, de the desk. This is Vic with Max. Hi, how are you doing today, sir? Wonderful, yourself? No complaints. Fantastic with you. Mm -hmm. yeah. had, a, had a great uh, podcast guest um, experience this morning. Uh, our good friend Steve Ramone introduced me to someone who's got a new podcast uh, starting up there in South Carolina, and that was a great experience. So. I always want to thank our friend Steve Ramona and you know, doing business with a servant's heart because he's been a, a, a true uh, mensch and a true, uh, true help to us. He's been a beacon to us. He really has. Oh, absolutely. You know, things he, he, that he's been willing to share. So, um, all of our audience, check out Steve Ramona doing business with a servant's heart. You also get to hear Vic and I talk some more. So, hey, what more can you ask for? I know. Steve, you know, I, I do want to talk up Steve because he is a phenomenal human being and a phenomenal person. Um, every interaction I've had with him, every experience that I've had with him has always been positive mm -hmm. and uplifting. Yes. And I don't think I've ever heard him say anything negative that brought me down. Instead, he would say something and give perspective. It's like, oh, I gained understanding from that. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. It's a great way of putting it. Yep. He, he's doing a wonderful service there with that podcast, doing business with Oh, yeah. Business. So he really is. Uh, in fact, I'm going to be back on it again uh, the second week of April. And uh, we're going to focus on that. And he wants me to talk about how to be the CEO of your life. To really walk through the steps. How anybody can do that. So I'm really... Really looking forward to that. Second week of April, we're going to be going down. Oh, yeah. We got to get him on here one of these weeks. We do. We absolutely do. Uh, we have to talk about how we want to use that time. Because uh, the three of us will go rambling off God knows where. We'd be off, but so far off the reservation, it wouldn't be funny. It'd be entertaining, but which is fine. But, I mean, we get him on here. We want to use him. To, to, to help the audience in a very specific way. He brings right. he brings information, knowledge, and wisdom that you know we we certainly are benefiting from. And if we're benefiting from it, I, I, I'm confident that our, that our audience would as well too. It. So we need to talk about what, how we want to structure that and not just make it a free, you know, free form all over the place conversation. So, right. But, but, but we need to do that. You're absolutely right. Oh yeah. We'll figure that part out. Okay. Um, now I'll, I'll think about that one just to make sure that one okay. Steve get Steve Steve's appreciated and also we don't, you know, go down too far the rabbit hole. Absolutely. There you go. So, so I, you know, for the audience today and and just in general, you know, I told you about how I came to what we wanted to talk about today and what we were what I was thinking about, and for context for the audience. Um, I was watching the Creed series because I want to go watch the third one. And, you know, I, I always do a follow-up of whatever movie series I'm, I'm watching by re-watching the originals mm -hmm. or the, the predecessors. And the quote that stood out to me today that I've been thinking about in depth is from Rocky Balboa. And I think it was from the second one. And he's, he, asks, he asks the question, or he poses the question as this, what good is the light that don't light? Now, I, I could try to do the Rocky accent and all that. I'll butcher the shit out of that. So sorry, mm -hmm. Sylvester Stallone, you're, you're the guy for it. But it, it led me to think about that and then think about what you and I are doing along mm -hmm. with our team at the executive's chair. But moreover, in general, with this podcast, with the work that we engage with, and our purpose, our passion in this life. And I had the thought that we are like a lighthouse. You know, we are the lighthouse in a tumultuous storm in a time when people are being pounded with the rain, the ocean, the grounding or the footing underneath is unstable. They don't feel secure. They feel lost, hopeless, desolate, maybe even frustrated. You know, that that storm is beating down. Mm -hmm. They're lost at sea. And we're the lighthouse. 
Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're offering hope and we're offering peace, but we're not like, you know, like you said, we're not going to be the ones in the boat, right? Well, I, I think if you if you adapt your illustration or your analogy to what we're bringing to the marketplace or to the world with the executive chair, is that we're, we're a combination of that light, that beacon, beacon of hope, a beacon of safety, beacon of refuge, however you want to use it, you know, the term it. We're also providing the map of the rocks, of the code right. that they're going to, that, that the safety that they, they come into. Uh, or if they're going out to, you know, on a voyage, you know, how, how, how do you set out to, you know, to, to um, claim your riches out there, claim your treasure? So we're offering both of those things. And, you know, you, I didn't think of it before when you brought it up, but, but when you, you, uh, Reiterated the quote there. It's almost like that light. That's a. It's our gift, you know. And what good is a gift? What good is if you have something if you're not giving it to someone? I mean, gift implies that you're getting it to someone else. All right. So what what good is a light if it's dark? What good is a gift if it's not given? And. We're not just trying to provide a process that if someone can use to <clears throat> just grow their business, and that's all. I mean, that's that's certainly a big, it's an integral, it's a big part of it. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, a necessity. But we're talking about something much bigger than that. All right, we're talking about not only working with visionary leaders who are, who are committed to growing world-class companies and, and creating world-class teams and creating world, other world-class leaders, visionary leaders, that next generation. We're talking about you know, CEOs and, and executives that want to have a world-class life, that really want to be CEO of their life. Right? And business is a huge aspect of that, a huge component. But also is the relationships they have at home, their the family, the loved ones, the friends, what they're contributing to in, in society, in the in their lo locality, wherever they are. Because we've talked about this numerous times, and we'll continue to talk about it. Small, medium business is the backbone of the American economy. It's the backbone of America. All right. I mean, it employs more people than you know all the big businesses combined. So. You know, those visionary leaders are also then the, the, the pillars or the lighthouses or the gifts to the community mm -hmm. as well, too. Because they're the ones that are serving, you know, in, in, in local political, um, running for office or school boards or the, 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 you know, the other boards that are involved. They're involved in, in their uh, local places of worship. They're involved in, in the uh, service organizations like you know, Rotary and Satoma, things like that, Lions Club. So, you know, our, our goal is to is to provide that that map, that roadmap. We keep using that term because I think it's a great map. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be interesting how many of our audiences actually held a map, but that you know, this you know, they held their phone, you know, and have been told by you know. Uh, mm -hmm. One of those programs, whatever they are, Google Maps or whatever it is, you know, where they, where they turn and everything. But we're, we're providing that map for them to have that, to, to truly be CEO of their life, not just of their business, but be, to be world class in, in both of those roles. Yeah. You know, it, he, going back to the analogy or the, the image that we've created. Mm -hmm. The, the the lighthouse stands alone on the edge of a cliff you know the lighthouse keeper sees the rocks below sees all the vast ocean that's out there mm -hmm. and they're on the edge of both the comfort and the safety that shelter provides the lighthouse and the coastline but also they're also on the edge of the danger the lack of stability that ocean the 
vastness of it. And there's a confidence that comes from being in that position where you're juxtaposed on the balance of both worlds. Mm -hmm. okay. Because, thank you. You have both understandings. You've seen comfort, you've seen chaos, and you know how to navigate it, both personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's what we're providing here is, hey, we see you out there, follow the blinking lights, or look at your map that we've provided, and you can go from the chaos out there into the harbor that is calm, and then be on land. Yes. So I think I've read that lighthouse keepers are often retired ship's captains. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's another uh part of this we're bringing to the table as well, too, is that we've been there and done this. You know, it's not like we went, we read some book or we took some mail order course or some online course to be the executive coach. I mean, we've been there and we've done it, right? Mm -hmm. we, we, we've wrecked the ship, all right? We've run into the rocks, yep. okay? Now, we've done that, too, right? We, we've brought the ship in safely into the harbor and all that good stuff, We've been there and done it on both sides of, of, of the of the coin. So that's that's we believe a totally different perspective to this whole concept of executive mentoring, executive coaching at the right. CEO level to be been there and done it. So we know not only do we have the map, but we know how to steer the ship. Now we're not going to go do it for you. Again, it's making that point right. very clear. But we, when we sit down and talk with you or work with you and coach you and mentor you, you, you know that we're speaking from experience, not from something we read in somebody put together a textbook and right. sent a copy out a mimeograph or whatever it was to 200 people that sent in 997 to, to take the course. Okay. Right. You got the scars to show. I do. I got the scars to show. Okay. So do I. You know, so um, that that is that is a major, uh, I think, a major distinction in, in what we're offering here in the executive chair. Okay. Oh, absolutely. We've, we've sat in the chair, mm -hmm. right? And the reality is, we're sitting in it again. Right. I mean, we're growing the business as well. So, you know, it's, that's the distinction. Oh yeah, and. And here's the thing, there's nothing wrong about doing the work, you know, being in the boat and steering the course. But you and I learned and others have learned as well, where, you know, the unhidden, where the hidden undercurrent is that pulls you closer to shore instead of farther out from shore. We've navigated the complexities of it all. Right. And we, we've realized how to utilize the tools that we have given to us, such as this simple little phone right here, how to utilize this to leverage a company. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 you said it spot on. It's our experience that people are getting, but also it's the lessons that we had to learn mm -hmm. what not to do, how not to do it, ways to do it better. We've earned the scars so that way they don't have to. And that's, that's the benefit of having somebody in the lighthouse is the former captain knows that coastline where they're at. They know the currents. They know the way the oceans ebb and flow based on the season. They know it intimately. And therefore, they are the source of how to get into harbor safely. Absolutely. <laughs> so... You know, people will, will ask us, well, who the hell are you guys to do this? We've done this, we've done this before. We've seen we've seen ships scuttled. We've seen ships get safe into harbor. We've also looked for the lighthouse and not seen it in our experiences. We've not had the guidance or the direction or the roadmap. We've constructed it. 
we have it. We know the ways to navigate it, not only you know professionally, but personally. How to be tenacious in a storm, how to be fearless in a storm. The, the 15 step roadmap in 18 months that we that I you know instructing that we're going to be basically using as our, our roadmap for our clients. One of the things in there that, I, that we talk about is surrounding yourself with excellence. And if you want to use the, the nautical analogy here, it's having the best crew on the ship with you because you can't be the captain. The captain doesn't run the ship. The captain's in charge of the ship. If the, if the ship runs aground, it's the captain's fault, even if he right. wasn't at the wheel. All right. But the captain doesn't run the ship on a daily basis. The crew does. And that's the same thing with crew and business. And I go back to this the interview that I, I was involved in today, and I, I was asked a really good question is that, you know, give us an example of what any business can do right now to completely change their direction. And I said, well, I asked the interviewer, I said, you've worked for a, a large corporation before. And she said, yes, I have. I said, Tell me about the one in three year growth, personal growth plan they had for you. And she looked at me, she said, I don't know what you're talking about. So I said, absolutely, you don't know. And it's one of the things that we mandate our clients do is that everybody in their organization has to have a one in three year personal growth plan. And then I went on to explain it to the interviewer, you know, what that really means. Well, if you look at Here's what we see for you, Rick, for your financial compensation for one year and for two years. Here's where we see you from a leadership or a management standpoint. You want to go into management? Here's where you need the tools you need, the resources you need, the experience you need. You want to stay in a technical, technical role? Wonderful. We need people with your knowledge, your experience, and your wisdom to, to fulfill those technical roles. You don't want to be a manager. Great. You've got a place for you here as well, too. This is what your compensation track looks like. This is what your potential bonus track looks like. These are the kind of people you're going to be working with. And these are the expectations they're going to have for you and your job. She said, that sounds amazing. She said, how many companies out there are doing that? I said, well, I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. I said, not, not, not enough. We'll just leave it at that. But the ones that work with us in the executive chair will be doing it, and they will see an almost immediate turnaround, mm -hmm. a reduction of attrition, a reduction of turnover, a reduction of absenteeism, an improved quality in the products and the services. They are going to see an increase in their top line revenue. They're going to see an increase in their profitability, and believe it or not, they're going to have some happy employees. My God, what a concept. Who ever thought of having happy employees? I mean, I know, right? Why would you want to do that? I mean, I don't I don't get that. So it, it, it was a great conversation we had. But that's an example of, of, of one of the things that we're gonna we're gonna bring to this that we've been there and we've done that. All right. And it, it makes us so different, so distinguished from everybody else out there. You know, people ask us, well, you know, who's your competition? There's so much need for this out there. We're not being smarmy or we're not being, being big, big headed. We don't have competition. There's so much need for what we're bringing to the marketplace right now that there could be a hundred executive chairs out there and it still wouldn't fulfill the need of us, you know, the, the requirements of what's needed out there. You know, every small, every business should have that one to three year plan for the employees. Every business should be focused on promoting from within and not just saying, but mm -hmm. actually walking the walk when it comes to what, what they're talking about. All right. The amount of institutional knowledge and experience that is lost each year is in the billions of dollars because people don't feel fulfilled. They don't feel a personal engagement with the organization. 
they don't feel that they're involved in building something bigger than themselves. And that's what we all want to do. Right. All right. We want to build something bigger than ourselves. And that's one of the tenets of becoming CEO of your life. And it's the absolute foundation for leaving a legacy, is building something bigger, being involved in. Now, you don't have to be the, the visionary of that. And you don't have to be the only one working on it. But if you're on a team that's building big, something bigger than themselves, not just putting right. in 40 hours and getting this report in by two to five o'clock, all right, where you can actually see the impact and feel the impact and measure the impact, then it becomes worthwhile too. And that's when you become engaged. Amen. I quit. I got to hey, tell me, quit preaching here. I don't, you know, I got to stop preaching. No, no. I, you know, you, you inspired the thought that as we're in the lighthouse, not only are we the light, but we're also sharing how to become the light yeah. for everyone that engages with us in what we do. We want them to become the lighthouse in whatever it is that they're doing. Let, let me ask you this. Would you, would you disagree that everybody has has light already in them? We're helping them uncover it and then one hundred percent and then shine it. And we all have the light, right? Now, we do. Some of it, it's very dim, right? I'll, I'll right. grant you that. Okay, go ahead. All right. Sorry. Well, here's the thing: we're taught, and this could be organizational, this could be cultural, whatever, that we can't shine our light. Because we have to fit the light into a setting that it, it doesn't have any oxygen to do so. You know, I've been in those roles where I could not be myself yeah. and my best self Absolutely. to benefit the company. Right. You know how much value the company lost because I couldn't be 100% me? Not in terms of, oh, personality and all that. No, my capability, being empowered to provide and contribute to an organization's growth yeah. and long-term you know plans no that had to be stifled that had to be dimmed what it just, if it just proves the, uni the universe is brilliant and has a plan because because you couldn't do it there you're now doing it here with us yep and you're going to have a much bigger impact but go ahead with your point i wanted to make that point there Right. Oh no! Their, it's, their it's loss a solid is point. our gain. Their loss is our gain. That's you know. I feel bad for them, not really, but I'm glad you're here with us. So go ahead. I want to hear. Oh, thank that. you, thank you. Yeah. So imagine this, and I, I want the audience members to listen to this and to really think: What if your career you had the you had been able to shine your light, to and you know let all the oxygen in into it and let yourself shine. How much of an impact would you have had in whatever role that you were fulfilling had you had that environment where you could be your full light? Now, look at the organization where it's at and just imagine how much more value they could have had, how much more they could have profited or benefited from mm -hmm. if they would just get out of their own way and let the people be their best selves empower, educate, support. You know, we're teaching people how to shed, shine their light and shed it forth, we'll say, we'll use the biblical term. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much brighter every organization is going to become because a person is going to shine their light a little bit brighter every day. Imagine the impact that that has on people who are looking for growth, looking for chances, looking for even just an ounce of faith in what they're doing is the right thing or where they're going is the right place. You asked in the last episode we did, what's the definition of a world-class company? Well, you just defined it right there because a world-class organization provides that environment provides that pathway, provides the resources, provides the, the permission to shine their light. It provides avenues for you to do that. And that's why we're going to fo we focus on the CEO because the CEO, that's got to be their vision. This has to be top-down, enterprise-wide mm -hmm. commitment. 
All right, this isn't something you can throw in at the middle management level that's going to permeate the, the organization. That ain't going to happen. All right, it's going to die a very quick and silent death. All right, it has to be driven from the top, and the CEO has to buy in, has to be committed that the impact for everyone in the organization is going to be something that affects the organization, improves the organization, grows the organization, and that they, as the chief growth officer, the CGO, mm -hmm. is totally responsible for. Now, there may be a project manager that deals with the day-to-day -day implementation. That's fine. But the one who's responsible, the one who's accountable, the one who has to stand up there at the pulpit every day and preach the sermons is that CEO. Yeah. Well, see, I love this because there I have seen organizations. I, in fact, had one director in my entire career who was exactly that light. Mm -hmm. He was the living embodiment of empowering the organization, all the employees, everyone within it, to be their best selves. Good. The sad part to this is that his direct manager, his VP of tech, stifled his light. Mm -hmm. So all the efforts that he put forth were for naught. Now, I was only with this guy for about a month. I was project hopping, and I got to sign for, under him for about a month. But in that month, I saw world-class leadership and management. And then I saw how quickly people who are afraid of light, who want to dim it because they're not comfortable mm -hmm. with it. How sad is that? You're not comfortable with light? Yeah. Like you said, this got this has to go top to bottom because this is a trickle down type of scenario where the C suite, it, the executive suite, is the one that's stifling the light of the VPs, and the VPs are stifling the light of the director level and vice, and and all, it goes all the way down. Or you know the reason, well, not the reason, a prevailing reason for that is that there is no enterprise-wide top down vision being communicated. Right. Because uh, the CEO really did buy into this, really committed to it, and then started making, you know, ensuring that that was driven throughout the organization, giving people permission to do it. Is it going to be 100% acceptance? No, that's not the point. Is it going to be prevailing acceptance? Yes. Right. Is it going to take time to change thinking, change behavior, change results? Yes, it can be. Is it going to be always be pretty and easy? No, not at all. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but if you are truly want to change the organization and, and, and transform it, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about going beyond the present thought. We're talking about transforming the organization as a whole. Yeah. That's the only way it can happen. Oh, absolutely. Top down, top down enterprise wide. It's oh, yeah. the only way it can happen. So, you know, we don't talk about transformation a lot, but that's really what we're really what we're talking about. We're talking about transforming organizations, transforming vision, transforming people's behavior, their thinking, their behavior, their actions. And then the results going beyond their present form into something that they can't even imagine where they do that. Right. You know, what's funny is I didn't remember that director that I worked with for, for a month until we started talking about this. Mm -hmm. But here, here's something interesting, you know, going into the whole transformational. There, I, I'm, a, I'm an MBA dropout. I started an MBA program and I got bored with it and very busy with my job that required me to get an MBA. So mm -hmm. obviously I didn't finish the MBA program. You know, I was told the prerequisite for any sort of elevation is an MBA. So I was like, okay, well, if that's the next step, I need to go get one. And then I found an organization that said, no, we don't give a shit if you have an MBA, just have the skills. And I was like, I'm out, I'm done. I've been doing 80 to hundred hour weeks over here. I'm, I'm out. Mm -hmm. So anyways, 
MBA dropout. And the, the topic, the class that I enjoyed most was leadership and ethics. Now, I had to study a shit ton about leadership styles, different leadership styles, and I had to dissect them. You know, they went all the way back to the ancient Roman methods of leadership and management. I had to learn all this crap. But what's interesting is all the research and all the psychologists that have dove into this, they, they, they've come up with two current trends that are in leadership. There's transactional leadership, and then there's mm -hmm. transformational leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, transactional is your everyday type of leadership. Hey, I'm your director. Here's your job responsibilities and assignments. You do this, you get paid. Right. That's, that's transactional. Or, hey, you do this on this project because I'm telling you to do it, and I'll give you in exchange praise. Right. That's 99% of the organ. I'm going to put 99.9% .9 of the organizations out there. Okay. Transformational leadership is, is different because it does have a transactional relate, you know, aspect to it where there is mm -hmm. that exchange of service for some good, in this case, money. Mm -hmm. But the leadership interaction is different because the leader, in terms of output from the employee or those within his organization, gets more than 100%. And not by demanding it, asking it, the leader creates an environment where the people devote more of themselves. You know, the buy-in internally for them is more than can be quantified to the point where production is over 100% output. So diving into this transformation, it stems with the leader. The leader is the one of the organization who creates either that transactional or transformational right. environment. Right. So if we, if we were to help leaders change their leadership styles and approach from within, you know, internally, they're doing the same thing. They're transactional with themselves. If I do this, I can do this. Right. By changing that, by making them transformational leaders, transformational CEOs, mm -hmm. it all starting with here, the impact that they're going to have on their organization, top to bottom, is going to be transformational. Mm -hmm. It's literally lighting the, the, the bloody fuse and watching the entire thing light up like a mm -hmm. Christmas tree light. Yep. Exactly what we're talking about here. Now, going back to your class, I mean, you, it, that was beautiful. That was well done. Thank you. Um, did they tell you how to do it or just tell you what to do? They just told me the theory behind it. Uh, they didn't even tell you what to do, let alone how to do it, right? Nope. Nope. I just uh, had to research it, and that was it, and then write little reports. Okay. All right. So it sounds really good in the class. You know, boy, what a concept, right? Uh -huh. Now, oh, yeah. what do I do with this, right? How right. do I do this? How do I, you know? You know, it's a great idea, but it's so interesting, what we, right? We bring to the table. Oh yeah, and now here's the you, thing: what you do, how you do it. Go ahead. No, no. Further with that thought is, you know, why the hell isn't there a program in an MBA or a class or some segment of here's how you apply the theory? There's mathematics has theoretical mathematics and then there's applied mathematics why the bloody hell isn't there a class and this is going back to your question and your statement from one of our earlier podcasts mm -hmm. there isn't a school on how to be a leader mm -hmm. there isn't a school on how to be a ceo mm -hmm. there isn't a school on how to not fuck up being a ceo but there is, a, there is a class on, oh, here's some leadership styles that may or may not have worked. Right. Theoretically. Yep. Come on. You know, um, I'm, I'm answering your question here by using an example. You know who Bobby Knight is, right? Yeah. The, the Indiana basketball player. You know, when he was at IU, he used to teach a coach. I mean, teach a class in coaching basketball 101. No and shit. You know that the every time he offered the class, it was it was closed out literally within seconds because the the, the you know the, the number of students 
You just couldn't get them in the room. Okay. Right. Uh, Jim Tressel used to be Ohio State's football coach, did the same thing. He taught coaching 101, coaching football 101, the same thing happened. Why? Because they've been there and they've done it. Right. How many business professors, how many these guys, you know, have, folks you know have actually been there and done it? Right. And the answer is. <laughs> You know, I'm not saying it's zero, but it's less than 2%. Right. It's the other side of the desk. How many of them have sat on the other side of the yep. desk? How many of them have laid awake at night worrying about making payroll? How many of them worried about, you know, oh, my God, we had a spill, you know, one of our machines screwed up and one of their employees got hurt? Mm -hmm. All right. None of them. I'll tell you that. None of them. Have. And that's why that's the, the, there's no classes like that. Yeah. Right. The other thing is, I found this out this week, and this one, this one stunned, stunned me. This stu uh, statistic. Guess the average age of a CEO in the United States right now? Forty-seven. Fifty-nine. Tough. Okay. Yes. Yes. Fifty-nine. The average age of a C-suite executive right now is lower fifty. Why is that? Well, a it's because it takes you a long time to get there. Right. All right. And B is that there's no preparation for you to get there. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. So you're doing all this on the job or, on, you know, in the position training. All right. And I'm not even sure those are two really good answers to your question. All right. I'm well, trying to figure that out as well. But you said 59, right? 59 years old is the average CEO's age in the United States right now. Okay, so here, here's my thought process. And I'm going to turn on my light so people can see me better. So okay. here's my thought process. 59 is an average. It's a, med it's a middle number, right? So that means we have those on the lower end. We'll say 50. Yeah. But we also have those who are closer to 70. Yeah. Okay. So... If those folks, you know, from the 50 to 70 range are becoming the CEOs of a company, do you, like, you know, looking at this from a retrospective point of view, why do you want to keep working at 50 to 70 years old? You know, that's the time that you want to enjoy being a parent with your grandkids and you want to enjoy more of the time because you've put in the work, right? So if, and, and this is where I'm going with it. Okay. You, you don't want to be a CEO until the day you die. You've got other passions, other dreams, other aspects of life that you want to live. The CEO route has gotten you there. It's given you the resources, time, money, whatever, to get you there. And this is more philosophical. It doesn't, need, it, it doesn't actually you know, need an actual response, but it's just, if, if a, you know, we'll say if a 60-year-old professional is getting asked to fill a CEO role. One, why wasn't he asked earlier? Two, is that something he really wants to do at that age when he's devoted his entire life to building up organizations? He may be financially benefiting from it, but he's also got other passions too. This is coming from the guy who four weeks ago said to the other guy that we're talking to right now, why don't we start a company and you be the CEO of it, Mr. 67-year-old guy? All right. That's true. Ah. Now, I don't know the answer to your question. Your question is extraordinarily valid and extraordinarily important. And I, I would love to, to see some research on that. But one of two or a couple of things just came to mind that we're talking about so much is, is that the next generation isn't prepared. And one of the most important things you do as a CEO is you identify and, and, you know, prepare your successor. That's one thing, okay? Um, well, I want to answer, I'll get the other part of it here too, is that if you are really committed to building something even bigger than yourself, then age doesn't matter, okay? And then the third thing is, which is what we talked about earlier is the holistic approach, is that I would say a significant portion of these, these individuals, life is so out of balance 
mm -hmm. between work and the rest of their life, that that's their comfort zone. That's their home. That's where, you know, it's taken them decades to get there. There's families learn to live around them. Their spouse or partner has learned to create their own life because Bubba CEO or Bubette CEO is never going to be working 60, 70 hours a week. The kids have learned that, that dad or mom or, you know, the CEO is not going to be at the, the violin recital or not going to be at the baseball game or not going to be at the dance recital. They've created their own lives around that. Now, are they living, in most cases, comfortable, very upscale lives? Yes. All right. Big houses, cars, the whole deal, all that stuff. But was mom or dad CEO there for most of it? No, probably right. not. All right. So are we assuming that, you know, you made the point, why wouldn't they want to spend time with their family and stuff like that? No, because they're not comfortable with that. They don't know how right. to do that. Right. All right. This is their life. This is their passion. Right. This is what gets them up in the morning. And it's also their escape. Right. And dealing with that stuff at home. And dealing right. with the broken relationships and the fact of communication. And the other thing is, is the ego gets awful strong after 10, day, 10 years, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Your ego gets pretty, and I, I'm I'm guilty of this myself. All right? Oh, absolutely, right and, there with you. You know, it's it, there's no there's no question that the perks and the benefits and all that having people listen to you and all that stuff. It's uh, it's what's what do they call it? A gilded cage. Yeah. Yeah, gilded cage. Yeah. Yeah. So. A couple of thoughts in response to your responses, and I, I'm, I'm thankful for them because they do add a different perspective and counter to my questions, right? Mm -hmm. You're absolutely, absolutely right. They find that life is imbalanced. Mm -hmm. You know, that aspect of the personal life, oh, you know, the shit that I ignored for 30 years, I don't know how to do that. We know, we mutually know a gentleman who works on helping people exit their companies and their roles to go live their lives. Mm -hmm. We also have heard stories where people get retired, you know, executives get retired and they go back to work within what, a year, two years because they can't handle the peace at home. And you're right. spot on. They're not used to that life that they've helped create for others. Absolutely. Now, I want to preface- a, Or they die of a heart attack. Right. Which is another way of dealing with it. Right, escapism. Yes. But here, here's the thing. There is no true source or a true term of balance. There is harmony. Mm -hmm. Because a true, you know, a balanced scale will always have a little oscillation. Absolutely. Harmony is finding the balance within that oscillation. It's the adjustment as your footing needs to be. So there is hope for those people out there who have devoted their entire lives to being the CEO of organizations, the CFO, CFO, CTO, whatever, there is hope because you can always put in the work to bring up the other side that's heavily dropped down in focus mm -hmm. and find the harmony in the oscillation. Like some days you're going to be CEO 80% of the day and the other 20% you get to be Chuck or hey. Steven or whoever you are. Hey. There are other days where you can be like 49% Chuck or Steven or Josh or whatever, and 51% CEO. Yep. There is always hope and hope will, and hope will always lead to something better. If you put in the time and the energy to create that harmony, learn how to create that harmony. There's the roadmap that we're going to provide for all the people that join us. Mm -hmm. Here's how you not fuck up life. And business. And I'm sorry to put it very bluntly, but that's no, it's fine. It's a, it's a great way of putting it. Absolutely. Like we we all we all want success in this life. We all want the grandiose titles and we want that we want to feel good internally because that's what lights up our passions. And that's why you and I are doing this today. 
Absolutely. Because we're passionate about this. We're also passionate about making a positive impact in people's lives. Mm -hmm. So when I pose that question, why are CEOs working? You know, it was a dumb question, but also it was one that led to the led to this. You're absolutely right. And you know, I just had this thought. The other thing that we I think are guilty of is that we assume they know something better. Mm -hmm. And what are we finding out in this organization where we met? When we're, we're doing, we're, we're do, working with, with a big audience, we assume that they're a lot farther on the path than they really are. Right. We're going half, we're going to have, we're having to go back to half, before stage one. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and that's a challenge for me. Not to go back to stage one, but to, to, to wrap my head around that and reframe my perspective on where people are. Yeah. And just because you have the title of CEO or king of the world or president, whatever that title is, doesn't mean you, you get it. It doesn't mm -hmm. mean that you understand this. It doesn't mean that you know how to have that. You called it harmony, harmony a lot. And, and that's going to be an ongoing challenge for us because mm -hmm. we're going to assume that they, 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 get, they get some of this. And I'm not so sure that's the case. And I'm you know so what? Sure that's... That you're spot on with that because that's where we have to challenge ourselves constantly with the question, do they know what we're talking about? Are, are we just assuming an, a level of understanding? Yes. Or do we break it down to a more microscopic level? Hey, this is how you talk to people. <laughs> yes. I mean, you remember my presentation, right? I Yes, I do. So me being the mindset person who helps people learn that there can be something different than what they currently believe. Mm -hmm. There can be hope. You know, I'm, let's, let's dissect my life for a second. From a very young age, my biological mother said, I'm exactly like my father. My father, my biological father was a cheater, a liar, a thief. He manipulated and abused people. He was the shittiest person that I could look at. And I, I, you know, I, I don't speak of this in a very, you know, negative way. It's just matter of fact. I laughed and cried tears of joy at his funeral rather than tears of sadness. I, tears of joy that I was free of him. So, when I get that comparison or that thought from, you know, my biological mother, you're just like your father. Well, liar, cheater, thief, manipulator, all that. It fucks with your head. Your whole perception of yourself and your beliefs about the world get negatively impacted. Absolutely. So if I can do the work to see that there is something that can be different, that I can believe something different about myself about the world that I interact with. Right. I should theoretically be dead multiple times over for the life that I've lived. Mm -hmm. And yet God has kept me here to keep beating my mouth open and telling people how to change their lives for the better. So if there's hope for a person such as I, a sinner such as I, then there is hope for anybody else out there. Mm -hmm. And they just need to know that there is something better. There can be something different than what their current reality is. Now, am I gonna do the work for them? Absolutely not. Am I gonna help them in the process of doing their work? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, if, they, if the person that I'm working with, that we're working with, the individuals, the collective, the community, everyone that we're working with, it is up to them to shine their light. They're the ones that put the dimmers on maybe their environment as well, but both of those can easily be changed by choices. Yeah. 
my uh, my rant's over. There you go. I, if, I have no. I, it's phenomenal. I have I have nothing to add to that, Richard. I think um, if, if if that resonates at all with anybody that listens to us, then they need to reach out to us and have that first conversation. With them. Absolutely. No safe conversation. No judgment. No. You know, no pitch. We're not going to try to sell them on anything. We're going to look at them, we're gonna understand where they're coming from and then just present how we might be able to help them and see if it yeah. resonates, if there's some harmony, oh, yeah. if there's some accord with them. And, but there's no doubt we can help them if this resonates. Oh, yeah. No question. You know, here, here's the thing uh, I am going to sell them something, Max. Okay, go ahead. You always do. Go ahead. I'm going to sell them the possibility that they can be better and that they can be their best selves. Because yeah. at the end of the day, that's what we want for people is to be their best selves. Yeah. You know, there's that there's that scripture. Uh, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, taking the religious aspect aside from that, not to dive into that, people get crazy about it. Yeah. Let your light so shine. That means be your best self so that others may see your good works. They may see you. They may see what is possible. And learn from that and follow you, right? Exactly. So I'm absolutely going to sell each person on being the best version of themselves because at oh, the end of yes. the day, why the hell not? Absolutely not. I stand corrected. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Can't add anything to it. I think we've done enough today, don't you? I do. You want to wrap it's, it up? I will. It's always a pleasure. And mm -hmm. thank you once again, Max, for uh, putting up with my bullshit. No, it's not, it's not at all. I think uh, I really... Uh, really resonated with, with the, the light analogy we started with and where it went. I think it was it was illuminating, no pun intended, for not only audience, but for us. Right. I, you know, I, there's no question that I'm learning every time we get together and talk with this. I mean, things, things clarify, they can deal more, and, uh, you know, I think what we're doing, is we're getting better conveying the message of that hope of that change of that transformation mm -hmm. and we can't ask for anything more can we nope um, thank you again it's always a pleasure to the audience members out there subscribe like and follow us okay. you'll see us now on multiple platforms and within a week or so we'll be on youtube with our own channel join the executives chair that's my plug for you this week get that Get that environment and that group that's going to support you in your growth and in your and in your transformation. Well, that, if, it's already on a waiting list, right? I mean, they got to get on yep. a waiting list. Okay, I mean, it's that's like true. I, I I did jump the gun on that one. They do have okay. to get through the waiting list. All right. Okay. They have to get through. They have to get through Vic's uh, test there. I mean, he's, he's going to you know make sure that you're you know you're serious. You're committed. So get on the waiting list. Absolutely. All right. So. Thanks for the reminder, Max. That that that's okay. a good reminder on my part. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Till next time. Thank Thanks. you. Have a good one.